Good morning. Um, I feel like I've drawn the short straw, but hopefully in 12 minutes I feel like the luckiest scholar here. <laughs> so, uh, my study asked whether we can learn to love the mega dairy and was kindly sponsored by the Trahane Trust. It all started with knocks and dairies. Um, never before have we seen the scale of reaction. 100,000 people signing petitions against this 8,000 cow dairy proposal, 14,000 direct objections um, to the council. And it changed the game completely. Uh, since then, I think we'll all agree it's become far harder to gain planning permission, it's set up resistance. And I wanted to understand where the real issues lie for dairy developments. What are mega dairies? Do we actually need them? And if so, what do we have to do to avoid future noctons? So how big is too big? Well, Dairy Co found that consumers don't actually have a firm idea. Only half responded with an idea, and as you can see, it's pretty um, broken down across all, all the size groups. I then asked animal welfare charities what a mega dairy was. They couldn't give me a clear answer either, but they did raise some interesting concerns. And this included system, of course, and I was specifically housed, group size, an inability to range extensively and when the cow's production impacts her body condition. So as herd size continues to grow and global markets drive efficiencies, could it be that anything other than this has the potential to be a mega dairy? Specialisation, scale, intensity, they're all hallmarks of the modernising dairy industry and they're all found in housed and intensive grazing systems. So expansion and larger scale dairy farming in these two systems was the focus of my study. The next question, do we need bigger farms? Well, global demand for milk is growing, but at the same time, the UK, unlike its European counterparts, has been struggling to meet its production potential. And filling quota might seem like a bit of an outdated um, concept now, but it's interesting that our biggest competitors, Ireland, Germany, Netherlands, Denmark, and even Poland, which isn't on this chart, have been able to fill their growing quota over the past few years, their eyes on 2015 and <coughs> the quotas. And this in mind, as the NFU said recently in the strategy document, it will become harder and harder for the British industry to defend even the static position. So with another 10% of producers intending to leave the industry in the next two years, how do we keep this static position or grow? That missing milk is going to have to come mainly from expanding existing herds, risking the development of mega dairies. So we do need some scale in the industry, but what about welfare claims levelled against large-scale farms? Throughout my travels to Northern Europe, um, North America, New Zealand, Australia, Israel, <clears throat> I found time and time again that management, not scale or system, is the deciding factor. There was evidence in my report, all the data, but also from the farms I visited, and I can't describe them all, but I just want to talk about a few of them. Um, this on the left is Alex Wright from uh, South Island in New Zealand. He has 800 cows, cross cows, on a grazing system, and on the right, Torsten Zahn from Germany um, has 1,000 cows housed year round. Those have 5% clinically lame cows in the herd, but the industry average in the UK is around 27%. Bob Bignami from Orland uh, in California on the left has 1,600 jerseys. He houses them year round, but he has outdoor loafing areas and he carves them on grass. Brian Brown on the right is from Wisconsin. He has 500 cows housed year round on sand. They both have 30 to 35 cases of mastitis per 100 cows per year, and our industry average in this country is 50. And then TJ Tulse on the left is um, in Wisconsin. He's got 5,000 cows housed year round on deep sand. And then Charlie Russell, as many of you will know, from Glen Appen, Scotland, has 700 cross cows on a grazing system. They have cell counts between 121 and 125,000. The industry average is 150. So what I'm saying is we can ensure good health <coughs> through management, but what does the cow herself want? And this is what the Farm and Welfare Committee asked. Um, in particular, whether a cow could behave normally when she's housed. And it's interesting that there's studies coming through from the US um, <coughs> and Canada and the UK finding that high yielding cows actually will choose to have a total mixed reaction and stay inside and eat over going outside to graze. And she likes to stay in in the day, even though she does like to go outside at night. She likes dry surfaces, soft, deep bedding. And all, these, um, all this information starts to tell us how new facilities can be designed around the needs of a cow. Now, although no work's been done yet on the needs and the preferences on specialist grazing systems, some farms I saw were starting to put in shade and shelter, <coughs> such as Tom and Victoria, and his dog Beyonce, great name. Um, and so obviously there's a recognition now of, of, of looking more to what the cow's needs actually are. So what about the horror stories on environmental impact? Well, 
The New Zealand dairy industry, as I'm sure you're aware, has one of the largest herd sizes in the world at nearly 100 cows, but it's suffered huge reputational damage recently and with pollution of watercourses. So Dairy New Zealand has set up two herds at the Ruakura Research Centre in Waikato, one at 3.2 cows a hectare and one at 2.6. And what they're looking to do is see if they can maintain income um, in the lower stocking rate while reducing leaching by 40%. Fonterra, on the right, seen as the New Zealand dairy industry by most of the public, is sending field staff out to help people to expand their effluent storage depending on what their soil type, rainfall, topography and so on is. So what we're seeing is there's big moves being made to try and up the environmental game on, how, on grazing systems. In house systems, Danish farmers like Peter Lundgren on the left are finding ways to reduce ammonia emissions <laughs> For example, he adds acid to his slurry to lower the pH and stop ammonia volatilisation. Others, like Larry Castanelli on the right, is making renewable energy out of slurry and capturing the methane. So the farmers involved in these developments are very proud of what they do, but they don't always get heard over the noise created by campaign groups. And because house systems remain unfamiliar to the public, they become the particular target of these groups. Adverts like this catch the public eye, through simple one-liners and by feeding people's preconceptions. And they're underpinned by multi-million pound campaigns, uh, social media PR reports, <coughs> influencing the food chain, and even international lobbying, like this push uh, to try and get legislation in Europe to make it mandatory to graze cows, and demands for method of production labelling on dairy products. So if the UK needs more milk and expanding farm size is the main way of providing it, what can the industry do um, to challenge these preconceptions, these negative perceptions. So while we might have love, uh, difficulty creating love for the mega dairy, I think we can certainly increase acceptance. Firstly, I think we need to prove the care for the animals and care for the environment that we, we give. So showing you can go the extra mile is the basis of the Green Tier Environmental Programme in Wisconsin. And Ken Bulow runs two 4,000 cow house dairies. There's one of just three dairy farmers in Wisconsin as part of the programme. The programme's run by the regulator and it's based on the farmer developing his own environmental management and auditing system and in return he gets a really light touch regulation. Ken says it's a way to build confidence about farming in a non-agricultural world. I think we can also increase acceptance if we're better at being good neighbours. I'm putting proper effort into relationship building, listening to concerns and handling them fairly. It's the little things that people appreciate like being able to keep their cars clean. And uh, Torsten Zahn in East Germany here, as well as sweeping the mud and manure off the roads, he uses the heat from his biodigesters to keep the local fire station and the community football club changing rooms warm. Uh, we can also increase acceptance if we think about the impact of large farms on their smaller counterparts. Evidence shows that farms at any scale can produce a good margin, but arguments of economies of scale aside, smaller farms lack the litres to generate sufficient investment funds often. So it seems to me we don't necessarily recognise the role small family farms play in promoting a positive image of the industry. There's a parallel in Denmark, uh, sorry, in Holland, in the Netherlands, uh, where the industry recognised that increasing housing might be affecting the public's connection with dairy farms if they didn't see cows out in fields as much. And so they, what they, what they did is they paid farmers to graze their cows and paid them an extra half or cent a litre as an incentive. And now all milk going into domestic products, which is around 15% of the total, is sourced from grazed milk. And the packaging says, this dairy product is made from Dutch meadow milk sourced from farms where cows spend at least six hours a day, 120 days a year between spring and autumn on Dutch pasture. And it strikes me that a similar move in the UK differentiating milk from smaller traditional farms may be one option to add value without negative campaigning about larger farms, like the Red Barn family farms have done in Wisconsin. Or can we help smaller farms introduce economies of scale without them having to grow? And in Israel, um, the Moshavim, or family farms, are typically clustered around a central feed station, and they share their use to nutritionists in the bulk feed buyer. So they enjoy economies of scale without having to grow. So either way, finding a way to ensure the survival and prosperity of smaller family units not only preserves the diversity of production we need in this country, but it reassures the public that some things will remain. And lastly, we can gain acceptance if we as a whole get our act together over communication. The messages from campaign groups get so much traction because our industry communications are fragmented and underfunded. U.S. farmers and ranchers fill that void in the States. They're creating open and frank discussion about food and farming and challenging untruths across all American farming sectors. If we push back in the dairy industry, I believe we'll start to find ways in which we can work more constructively with welfare groups. And um, 
John Barrington at Scottish Sea Farms does this. He's been working for years with the RSPCA on salmon, his salmon farming in the Scottish Highlands, and now all of his um, all of his uh, salmon supplies the MS Lochmere brand. So to conclude, I learned an awful lot on my travels. I learned how cows like to stay cool. I learned dogs wear sunglasses. <laughs> I learned some strange marketing products are out there. And also there's a lot of cow parade cows in the world. I know where to get my dear's head stuffed for $425. And I found out how Israeli farmers tell people they've got robotic milkers. I still don't know what that cow's saying and I don't think I want to. <laughs> so I want to um, conclude with three points. I was so impressed by the sense of purpose and unity in the other countries I visited. To take Ireland, all developments are focused on increasing milk solids production by 50% by 2020, as detailed in the government's food harvest report. If it doesn't deliver on this, they don't do it. Clear and simple. And it reminded me of the story of President Nixon visiting NASA just before the moon landings. He stopped a man holding a broom in the corridor and asked him what his role was. And the man says, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. I would like to see us to stop bickering here in this country between grey systems, house systems, small, large, organic, conventional, and actually look instead at the big job of retaining and growing British milk PLC and work together. Secondly, who should be deciding how we produce our milk, how big our farms are and what systems we use? We need to take more control of how we address society's expectations. And in fact, since coming back, I've been working on a project with a business partner, some large-scale dairy farmers and three agribusinesses to see how we can better prove top class welfare and environmental respect. Thirdly, I still hear loads of criticisms about the Nocton Dairy proposal. Yes, they moved the goalposts, and yes, we all have a view on what they should have done differently. But as T.S. Eliot said, only those who risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. I'd like to thank my friends and family, my Nuffield colleagues, and the Trahane Trust for making this possible, and for Pete for giving me so much encouragement in the first place. Thank you. Thank you.